we're talking about North Korea, the runner-up for best Korea. Hey, silver metal isn't bad. You can melt that down in your factory and make a plow. Now, most reporters are focusing on asking the question, where in the world is Kim Jong-un? But when you start looking at the North Korean financial situation, well, I'd want to disappear too. Now, this episode definitely falls under the one for me portion of the one for them, one for me framework, as I'm going to be looking at North Korea's economy pre-pandemic and today. Now, the first question you might be asking is, North Korean economy? Well, you can't miss what you never had. But this is where things get interesting enough to make an episode, because the government of Kim Jong-un and his father Kim Jong-il ran tight fiscal ships, spending within their means and not resorting to inflationary financing. Yes, despite the famines and complete lack of development in North Korea, they've maintained an entirely balanced federal budget since 2003, without having to resort to bond issuance. Of course, their taxes are a little more intense than ours, and the state owns the means of production, so that's where the profit goes. Now, This is why it's so significant when we heard earlier this week that the country's fiscal resources are overwhelmed, forcing Pyongyang to issue domestic bonds for the first time in 17 years. That's right, if you've ever wanted North Korea to owe you money, now could be quite the opportunity. So what the heck is happening? Well, For a while there, North Korea's economy has been based on two principles. First, self-reliance. And second, oh god China, please keep buying and selling stuff with us. Unfortunately, as of recent, self-reliance has been forced to take center stage. North Korea plans to keep its borders shut until there is an effective diagnosis and treatment method for COVID-19. That's right, North Korea closed their borders which includes their border with China. So now North Korea is left to its own devices facing the coronavirus pandemic without access to credit or emergency financing from the IMF, World Bank, Asian Development Bank or other governments, let alone access to global capital markets. So now North Korea is entirely on their own, trying to self-finance a pandemic response and public programs. This brings us back to their first bond sales in 17 years, and a new question. Ah, uh, who's going to buy a North Korean bond? These bonds will exclusively be sold domestically, which does make for an easier sale. Hey, how would you like to invest in this exciting new North Korean program? Or would you prefer to be target practice? Now, For this, enter the Donju, or money owner. The easiest way to think about this next part is to picture North Korea as a Chuck E. Cheese. When you show up at a Chuck E. Cheese, you can't use US currency to play the games. You have to buy tokens that only function within the franchises. So you're freely exchanging your Chuck E. Cheese tokens and just having a great time whacking moles. Problem is, uh oh, Chuck E. Cheese needs to buy a new machine. Well, they can walk up to the manufacturer and say, here are a thousand Chuck E. Cheese tokens. If you show up to one of our locations, I swear they're worth something. Or they could start shaking down anybody currently at the Chuck E. Cheese that might have brought in US dollars or Chinese RMB, so that they have a currency that's accepted outside of their store. North Korea used to have a steady supply of foreign currency streaming in, because every time China bought something from them, they didn't use North Korea's Chuck E. Cheese coins, but rather RMB. Problem is, now that trade with the outside world is gone, so has currency with value. With this new context, you're probably really understanding why this class of people, or Donju, are called money owners. They got their money by, to go back to my metaphor, being the people at the Chuck E. Cheese in charge of interacting with the outside world. They have a special privileges of import or export you know, of the North Korean the product. Mm -hmm. And these, you know, the rights of a privilege of trade are given by the party or the government. To get back to the crux of the episode, North Korea issuing debt for the first time in 17 years, the aim of the debt issuance is to collect as much foreign currency circulating in the country as possible. 
Now this is necessary because North Korea might not be able to produce enough food and medical supplies for the nation, and they don't seem willing to make the basic transparency reforms required to qualify for aid. So they're going to have to scrounge up enough money to buy everything they need from other countries. Now this brings us to a critical juncture in the North Korean policy that is yet to be resolved. How self-reliant should we be? Now for a long time their balanced budget was able to rely on getting cash from international sales and making domestic payments using taxes of their own currency. But you can't domestically tax a foreign currency into existence. Now this is why bonds targeting money holders are crucial to the short term survival of the nation. Unfortunately, there is only so much currency in the country, and ventilators are really expensive. Kim sends a letter to South Korean President Moon Jae-in asking for help in combating coronavirus. Pyongyang requested a rush order for medical supplies from China, although that's an order so they have to spend money. And the regime also secretly asked for urgent international help to increase COVID-19 testing in North Korea. Unfortunately for them, viral testing isn't rocket science. Now this is where things get really interesting though, because with the big man missing, things on the ground could change really fast towards supporting the goal of getting cash with value or domestic reforms to qualify for aid. Let's temper our expectations a bit though. There are no indications from Pyongyang that it is ready to throw in the towel on Ju Chi or its official policy of self-reliance and embark on reform and opening. Of course, there's not much of an indication of anything right now in North Korea. The latest is the leader staying at a luxury resort because we found luxury boats nearby. Fancy boats and a nice resort? What a suspicious combination. Longtime North Korea watchers are saying, humanitarian assistance is likely to come with expectations that no Kim regime has ever been willing to meet. But dreamers are saying, yeah, but what about not the Kim regime? There's a pretty low bar for humanitarian aid reform, basically just ensuring that some percentage of it goes to the people in need. Unfortunately, every time North Korea gets support, it all immediately gets directed to the military. And they tell the organization who gave the aid, what are you going to do, boycott our country? Not give us a future loan? Ha, huh, we're self-reliant, right China? If there's even a hint of a leadership crisis in the country though, I can guarantee that the IMF and other international lending organizations are going to fire up their pitches and start sending mail with all the credit cards that North Korea has been pre-approved for. All loans made in US dollars. North Korea previously applied for an IMF loan in the 90s but got rejected after they refused transparency requirements that would have verified where the money was spent. As long as there's a Kim in power, it seems like North Korea is going to be furiously self-reliant. But if something happens, people are pointing to China and Vietnam as examples of closed communist countries opening up and benefiting from it. Both communist China in 1978 and communist Vietnam in 1986 recognized that opening up and reforms were essential to lift their economies out of destitution and improve prospects for political stability. Now, There's a lot we don't know right now, and who knows, maybe North Korea will be able to weekend at Bernie's their way through this crisis. In the medium term though, their economy is one of the many things that was made in China, and they're just waiting for everything to reopen again. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hey YouTube, if you're wondering why I sound so good in these episodes now, it's because I was able to buy new audio equipment thanks to my patrons over here. If you want to join this growing list of exceptional individuals, click on the link in the description. If you like what you saw, remember to give me a thumbs up, and as always, thank you for watching.